150 years ago, in 1860, Canada, with its vast stretches of unsettled land and small, scattered population, was not yet a nation. Canadian Methodists were fractured into seven different denominational bodies. A decade later, Canada had become a nation with its own Prime Minister, but the move to unite the various Methodist bodies into a respectable, socially acceptable denomination bothered some. Among them, Robert Loveless, a concerned Canadian primitive Methodist layman in Toronto. In 1873, he found a copy of B.T. Roberts' Ernest Christian magazine in a post office. He was deeply moved by what he read about the message, the passion, and the vision of the Free Methodist Church. And he invited Roberts to come and speak in Toronto. This is where the story of the Free Methodist Church in Canada begins. Three years later, in 1876, Roberts sent Charles Sage from the North Michigan Annual Conference as a missionary to Canada. At the time, Sage felt this appointment would crush him. Two years later, when 28-year-old Daniel Marston was also appointed to Canada, he dropped his head on at the seat in front of him and cried like a child. Marston said to Sage, the idea of sending a boy to Canada their work for the next several years involved responding to invitations from Canadian Methodists who were troubled by the drift toward union, toward middle-class propriety, and away from Wesleyan fundamentals. They gathered these disaffected Methodists into new Free Methodist congregations throughout Southern Ontario. Not everything went smoothly in those early days. Sage admitted he was unacquainted with the people and customs of Canada, especially their natural prejudices against the Yankees. When promoting his revival meetings, Sage billed them as a chance to see a live Yankee preacher. Later, he reflected, I could not have done a worse thing. Four years after Sage arrived in Canada, B.T. Roberts organized the Canada Annual Conference in Galt, Ontario. Three years later, the work was being led by Reverend Albert Sims, the first Canadian superintendent. In 1884, the other Methodist bodies in Canada f had formed their final union, leaving Free Methodists as the only non-mainline grouping of Methodists left in the country. The move in 1880 to form a District of North Michigan Conference into a Canadian Annual Conference was a leap forward in developing an indigenous contextualized voice north of the 49th parallel. At the same time, Canadian Free Methodists now had their own voice in the denomination's legislative body, the General Conference. In his State of the Work report in 1880, Charles Sage was passionate about the task still to be done in Canada. We have no place for lounging, whining preachers. We need men baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, with the love of souls at heart, who've never learned to retreat and don't know when they're whipped. Sage was obviously speaking of men generically, because two years later, conference appointments included 10 women on the roll. Fast forward 40 years now to Sarnia, Ontario, just across the border from Michigan, where Canadian leaders came together in an all-Canada convention in 1920. The Canadian annual conferences spread across the country, but all related directly north-south to the North American General Conference, with no east-west national dialogue among themselves. From the Sarnia Convention would emerge a new Canadian identity, the development of the Canadian Free Methodist Herald magazine, and work toward founding Canadian pastoral training schools. The establishment of a Canadian executive board would coordinate uniquely Canadian objectives and retain financial contributions for Canadian ministry concerns. Albert Sims, who had direct connections back to Canadian beginnings with Roberts and Sage, was elected chairman of this new board. Charles Fairburn, later Bishop Fairburn, was a delegate with connections to the future of the movement. The intervening years led toward the fulfillment of the vision and goals set forward at that 1920 gathering. In 1971, however, some laymen at the two Ontario conferences suggested it was time to start thinking about the next step, full autonomy as a general conference. Although there was strong support for this from the Canadian side, 
American leaders objected to any Canadian ideas of secession. As an interim measure, the concept of a jurisdictional conference, now known as a provisional general conference, was birthed, and the Canadian Jurisdictional Conference was approved in 1974, with Bishop Donald Bastion, a Canadian, being elected to serve as Canada's first resident bishop. The challenge posed for Bishop Bastion and the team of Canadian superintendents was to shape a movement unsure of its identity and place in its own context, yet eager for change in advance. Bastion would lead the Free Methodist Church in Canada for 20 years through growth, leadership development, and organizational maturity toward the inauguration of the Canadian General Conference in 1990. As we reflect on Canadian contributions to 150 years of Free Methodist witness, we think of people like Charles Fairburn. He was a gifted pastor from Eastern Ontario who went on to become an evangelist and pastor in the United States until elected as bishop in 1939, a role he fulfilled for more than 20 years. Fairburn had suggested a fifth bishop for Canada as early as the late 1950s. He was instrumental in the development of Christian Youth Crusaders, or CYC, while serving as the director of the Commission on Education. Just before his retirement, Fairburn played a key role in the merger with the Holiness Movement Church in Canada, which also brought significant work in Egypt and Hong Kong under the Free Methodist umbrella. James Gregory from Ontario founded Lorne Park College in Mississauga, then went on to serve as president of Spring Arbor College in Michigan and as editor of the denominations The Free Methodist magazine. Canadian pastor J.W. Haley and his wife Jenny went to Southern Africa in 1902 where they served as missionaries for more than three decades before moving on to the Great Lakes region of Equatorial Africa in his 50s to establish new work in Burundi, Rwanda. This area of Africa is today home to one of the largest concentrations of Free Methodists in the world who in turn have given birth to ministry in Congo, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and southern Sudan. Canada has come full circle now with Rwandans and Burundians planting churches and serving in leadership in the Canadian Conference. Canadian Holiness Movement missionary Alton Gould served in China, as did Canadian Free Methodist missionary Stanley Riding both of whom contributed to laying the foundations of Free Methodist ministry in Hong Kong in the 1950s. It was Gould who gave birth to what is now the International Child Care Ministries program. In the early 1960s, a Canadian local church with connections in Hong Kong birthed a new notion, young adults serving abroad in short-term mission assignments. Canada Youth Abroad was organized and directed by Free Methodist churches in Toronto. They sent a small team to Hong Kong for a year, including a young Gary Walsh. Several years later, this idea was picked up by the American Missions Department and rebranded as Volunteers in Service Abroad, Visa. In the past decade, the Canadian Study Commission on Doctrine began work on rearticulating the Free Methodist understanding of entire sanctification. This eventually gave birth to a new statement adopted by Free Methodist General Conferences around the world under the leadership of the Free Methodist World Conference. Canada's present bishop, Keith Elford, served for two terms as the first president of this new body after it was inaugurated in 1999. This World Conference has fleshed out a new international identity for Free Methodism. Bastion articulated a ministry truism faithful to the Wesleyan worldview and a contextualized mystiology when he said, I cannot see that the church really grows anywhere if it does not grow where a particular congregation meets and ministers. My concern is for the growth of the local church. At the 1993 General Conference, it was this very concern that led to fundamental changes in Canadian Free Methodist organizational structures and practices. A motion called for a, a thorough study of denominational structures and procedures so as to ensure efficiency and effectiveness. This became newly elected Bishop Gary Walsh's key assignment for the next several years. What emerged from this process was a renewed emphasis on the pivotal role of local churches 
in advancing the gospel in communities across Canada. Denominational structures and procedures were reconfigured to ensure that personnel and financial resources were more focused on empowering kingdom growth at the local church level. A renewed emphasis on developing healthy churches, missionally oriented pastors, and church planting among groups and communities without effective witness. This has led to new works being started across the country. At the present moment, 25% or one in four of our Canadian Free Methodist Churches is a congregation planted since 1995. In 150 years, we've come a long way from the days of B.T. Roberts and the Free Methodist world of 1860. As Canadian Free Methodists, we join with Free Methodist brothers and sisters around the globe to joyfully commemorate 150 years of history and to look forward with faith and vision to a future of faithful witness and service until in the fullness of time we celebrate together for eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Lord of history.